Hello everyone and welcome to the United Church in Rill. My name is Paul Robinson, I'm the minister here at uh, the United Church in Rill and it's wonderful to be able to welcome you uh, as we gather together to worship God, to praise the name of Jesus Christ, uh, to hear from his word. And a little later on in the service tonight there will be an opportunity if you wish to share in communion together. And the way we do that here is uh, is that if you have uh, maybe a little bit of bread or a cracker or or something to eat and a little bit of maybe wine or squash or even just some water to hand then uh, you're invited to join me as we share together and so if you want to pause the video now and go and get those bits if you haven't got them already to hand then then do so and then press play in a in a few moments time when when you're ready I just have uh, one little piece of news and uh, and a notice to share with you uh, and that is that uh, the small groups that we're meeting together here in Rill for worship in person are going to recommence this week uh, after the uh, recent restrictions in Wales have now been lifted and we're able to gather together. That will look and feel very much like it has done in the past. If you uh, if you want to start coming to those groups, then do just get in touch or um, uh, check your emails because there's been information about that this week. Right now, though, we gather to worship God and to hear from his word. And in Philippians chapter two, we hear this hymn from the early Christian church and talks of Jesus Christ being in very nature God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Well, let's acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord tonight in our opening hymn. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow.
Amen. Let's continue in worship as we come before Christ in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize you this evening as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, reigning supreme over the whole of creation, sat at the Father's right hand. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came not just to save a few, nor simply your own people, but came that the gospel might become available, your love available for the whole world. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, your love reaching out to the ends of the earth and your glory filling the universe. Mighty Saviour, Lord Jesus, in thanksgiving we worship you this evening. We thank you that though you were born in Bethlehem and you, you ministered in Galilee, though, though you spent your life in Palestine and died in Jerusalem, your love has transformed lives in every country and continent, crossing barriers of culture, colour and creed, unable to be contained by either space or time. We thank you that your, your love your love is incredible, that there is no one for whom your love cannot reach, whoever they may be, whatever they have may, may have done. You value every single human being. You have time for all, and you respond in love as folk reach out to you. And so we greet you now in this time of worship as the sovereign Lord, the one who reigns in splendor, enthroned at the right hand of the Father, the one in who in the fullness of time will reconcile all things to yourself, making peace through your blood and establishing your eternal kingdom. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that as you promised in John's gospel, you have given us your Holy Spirit to journey with us through these days until that day when we can join with those saints around your throne. Lord Jesus, Saviour of all, we do look forward to that day when every knee shall bow to you and every tongue confess that you are Lord and Saviour. And so, Lord Jesus, to you be praise and glory, honour and thanksgiving, now and always. Come, Holy Spirit, Renew us, restore us as we worship Jesus. Come Holy Spirit, speak your words this evening. Come Holy Spirit and share with us the presence of the risen Lord Jesus in our lives, in our homes as we gather to watch this video. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Amen. Well, tonight we continue our journey through the chapters, chapters 15, 16 and 17 of, of John's Gospel. And we're going to turn to God's Word in a moment and hear, hear part of that passage read for us. These chapters share with us the conversation Jesus had with his disciples. Somewhere, somewhere between the upper room where they had shared their last supper and Gethsemane where Jesus would be arrested. And we don't really know whether they had set off yet from the, the upper room, whether they had arrived in Gethsemane, or maybe something else. But I think I prefer the idea that this was a conversation that was shared as this group of people, the disciples and Jesus, walked through the quiet streets of Jerusalem that night. As they passed houses, they could hear the families celebrating Passover. As Jesus saw a vine climbing up the side of a building, he speaks about how in the days ahead, the disciples must be like branches abiding in, a, in the vine. As they near the city gate and have the first breath of fresh air away from the, the smell of the city, Jesus talks of the, of the Holy Spirit coming to be a loving advocate out of the city and, and into the Kidron Valley. And Jesus answers some of the disciples' questions and and those who were able to use the notes that I prepared for today will have looked at how in this moment Jesus tells the disciples of his, of his personal resurrection presence that they will see and they will experience the opportunity to be able to pray themselves and ask the Heavenly Father for blessings and gifts. And he would talk of the hope that the disciples can have because Jesus has overcome. He's, he will overcome sin and death on the cross. He will overcome everything. Then as they hit the bottom of the, the, the valley floor of the Kidron Valley, they start to rise up out the other side. And the sides of the Kidron Valley are, are really steep. It's, it's quite a climb up to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. They would be used to it having walked that way many times, but perhaps it's not so easy to walk up the Kidron Valley mountainside, valley side, after they've eaten their biggest meal of the year, that Passover meal, where they've really enjoyed themselves. This is like walking to the top of the Great Orm after your Christmas lunch. And I can imagine the group taking a little breather as they continue to climb up. Doing that thing where, you, where you're climbing and then you stop and you look back over the way you've come. And as they, as they looked back, well, they, they would take in the view as they caught their breath. That was all they could hear to start with, them catching their breath. Then they would become aware of the night sounds and the grasshoppers chirping and the like, and a stillness. And in the view, they looked across the city, across the city of Jerusalem, to the hills that would be rising above it, maybe with a little bit of light in the sky still. Those hills rising up behind Jerusalem from where they were looking, the first was the rubbish dump known as Golgotha. In the silence that descended, the Spirit moves in Jesus and he prays. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples and for believers everywhere. And we are hugely privileged and blessed that here in John's Gospel in chapter 17, we have the words that Jesus used in prayer that night and in that moment. And we're going to hear the first part now, verses 1 to 5 of John chapter 17. After 
after Jesus had said these things, he looked towards heaven and he prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we want to thank you and praise you for the, the wonderful privilege and blessing it is to hear words that Jesus used in prayer. We thank you for the way your spirit was at work as he prayed. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in us now as we think on these words as we listen for what it is that you are saying to us tonight. Come have your way, Lord Jesus, we pray, by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, as I said in that introduction, I think we are, we are mightily blessed that here in God's word, we have recorded for us the words of Jesus' prayer that night. We know that Jesus was a man of prayer, often heading off, we're told, by himself to pray. We often hear little short sentences of prayer, particularly as we head nearer the cross. Not my will, but yours be done. That's a prayer that Jesus said, isn't it? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Into your hands I commit my spirit. But here in John chapter 17, we have the words of prayer, not, not in the face of an immediate issue, but driven by Jesus' desire to pray in that moment, perhaps as they stood on the side of the Kidron Valley looking back over Jerusalem. And in this first section of the prayer that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks, Jesus prays for himself. He'll go on to offer prayers of intercession for his disciples and then for other believers. But, but first, he prays for himself. And in one sense, that makes it a little hard to hear what God is saying to us in this moment 2,000 years later. If you didn't know, you are not Jesus I am not Jesus, we are not Jesus, we're not about to go to the cross to save the world from sin and conquer death. We, praise the Lord, we don't have to go through that because Christ has done it for us. So perhaps this isn't a model prayer for us to use and to use these words like maybe it's the Lord's Prayer. I don't think we should do that, but I do find here that there are various encouragements and invitations for our own prayer lives. If Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to whom every knee shall bow as we've been singing and reflecting on already tonight, if he needed to pray for himself, then perhaps you and I should be a little less reserved about doing so ourselves. Because, you see, I think quite often we, we don't pray for ourselves. We offer all kinds of prayers. For, we lay out all kinds of requests for others, for our community, for our world, for the future, for our families, for our church family. And, and yes, friends, so we should. So we really should and we must. But not to the neglect of praying for ourselves. So what encouragement do we see from Jesus? How should we pray for ourselves? I think we see four things in our 
in our little passage, just in those few verses at the start of chapter 17 of John's Gospel. And I think the first thing we note is that this, this prayer, when Jesus prays for himself, is a prayer for now, for that moment. The opening words of Jesus' prayer were in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Now, scholars of John's Gospel will tell you that uh, time is a bit of a thing in John's Gospel. And that theme, uh, that thing kind of begins right near the start of the Gospel. You remember when Jesus is with his mother at the wedding in Cana? The wine runs out mid-festivities. And mum, being mum, tells Jesus, presumably in front of all of the other guests and servants. And Jesus like when any of us get told by our mum, is not too impressed. Why do you involve me in all of this? He says, my hour has not yet come. This isn't the moment, Jesus says to his mother. This isn't it. Over a few empty wine jars. This isn't the moment that I've come for. This isn't the moment when the whole of, the, of his heavenly father's plan is going to come to light. This isn't the the crowning moment of his glory, changing some water into wine. And that phrase, my hour has not yet come, is repeated all the way through John's gospel, moment after moment. No, now is not the time. No, my hour has not yet come. And then, John chapter 17, verse 1. As Jesus prays for himself before he heads into Gethsemane to be arrested, Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. This is it. This is the moment. This is the time. The cross is that moment of crowning glory where sin and death are defeated, where God's plan for salvation is displayed for all the world to see. This is the moment. This is the hour. And in that moment, in that moment, Jesus knew he needed to pray. That doing so would make a difference. Now, in that moment. And there's something, there's something very specific and immediate about that. Jesus is not praying over any regrets for what has gone before. For conversations along the way with religious leaders that haven't quite gone how he might have envisaged or, or how, how would have been most helpful for them. He's, he's not praying for what's going to happen in three days time or in a week's time or next year or before the end of time. He's praying in this moment. The night of his arrest whilst he is with his disciples together like this pretty much for the last time with all the fear and anxiety rising within him the need for that steely determination that courage that faithfulness to face this moment Jesus prays for himself and friends I'd encourage us to do likewise the hour has come this moment is now here tonight this afternoon, if you're watching this, whenever you're watching this, this moment is this moment with the emotions, struggles, joys, pains, and delights that this moment brings. And it's good to pray specifics in this moment because so often our prayers get lost in the generalities of the future or in the past. But Jesus prays for what is going on right now. So I'd encourage you to, to pray for a peaceful heart and mind tonight so that you have refreshing sleep. Pray for the strength and courage to resist that temptation you feel in this moment. Pray for the resources of love and grace to make that phone call, to offer that word of forgiveness or that assurance. Pray for something that will make you laugh and smile before the day is out. Pray for that nagging pain to go and for that fear to ease. Pray, pray for you now and how you find yourself in this moment. 
Jesus prays for himself and it is a prayer for now. Secondly, we see that Jesus' prayer for himself is also a prayer for God's glory. If it's astounding that Jesus should be praying for himself, it's equally astounding that in front of his disciples he should pray that his heavenly Father be glorified. One of the most difficult tasks of Jesus' ministry, I think, has been teaching and sharing with his disciples that he really is the Son of God. That, that he is the longed for Messiah and the saviour of the world and the promised one of God. That he is no ordinary human being. That he isn't just a good teacher or a brave martyr. But he is the king of kings, the lord of lords and he is the son of God. And because of his uniqueness, Jesus' prayer does talk of his own glory in a way that perhaps we, we wouldn't be as bold to talk. And neither should we. Yet in the midst of it all, he prays that he might be glorified, not for his own end and for his own gain, but so that his heavenly Father might be glorified. So verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, glorify me, that, that your Son, that I may glorify you. Well, friends, we, we often pray for God. Uh, our heavenly father to be glorified it, it's there in the lord's prayer hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we pray that god's kingdom would come that the name of jesus christ might be raised up in our towns and our communities that the glory of the love and grace of god would be seen and known and so we should but note here how Jesus' prayer is not simply that God would be glorified in this kind of vein, but that he himself, right now, in this moment, might glorify God. Jesus is not praying that by some magnificent intervention of divine power, God's glory would be revealed out there in the world somewhere else as he looks over Jerusalem at night. No, he prays that by his own words and by his own actions and his thoughts, by his heart and his mind and his soul, by what's going on inside him, he himself might glorify God. And I think we should be encouraged to, to do likewise. Not just to pray for the glory of God to be revealed in the world as if it's something that God's going to do over there, out there, somewhere else but to pray for ourselves that we might be the ones who bring that glory to God and bring his glory to bear in our towns and our communities. Manchester United fans support their team and long for their te that team to do well and hope each weekend, hope beyond hope at the moment, that they might win. A Manchester United player, though, may have that same hope of, of winning, of victory. But they also have that responsibility to make it happen. It's one thing to be a supporter that hopes that those 11 players over there might pull a, out a victory. It's another to be one of those players who hopes of scoring the, the winning goal, of making it happen, of, of securing that victory. And friends, so often I think, I know I've found myself doing this on reflection now, um, often we pray, we end up praying like supporters of God, hoping and seeking and wanting to see his goodness and his love and his grace rise in our community and our town and our world over there. And, and that's great, we should. But Jesus here, I think, encourages us to pray more like a player, like a member of the town of the team, praying and hoping and longing to be the one who right now is able to bring that glory to God. Praying that our own words and our thoughts and our deeds might be part of God's goodness, love and grace rising and his glory shining in this world. The invitation in this prayer is to not only be a supporter, but by God's grace, to take our part and bring glory to God. 
So Jesus' prayer for himself is, is a prayer for himself right now. It's a prayer that he himself might bring glory to God. And it's a prayer for himself. Verse 2, for, for you granted him, the son, me, authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Well, Jesus here is praying about the work that his heavenly Father had given him to do. What was that work? Well, that prayer told us a little bit. He had been given authority over all people so that he might give them eternal life. Now, this, this eternal life will come to people by recognizing that Jesus, the miracle-working, teaching, loving, compassionate Son of God that John's Gospel shares with us, this Jesus, this Jesus dies on the cross for our sin. He dies our death such that by faith we are promised eternal life. That's how that eternal life will come. Now on Thursday night, Monday Thursday night, just a few minutes, or maybe it's an hour or two at most, before his arrest, where are we at? Well, Jesus talks as if his work is done, doesn't he? Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Yet we know the cross still awaits. That'll be tomorrow. On Good Friday. But in many senses, certainly from a human perspective, after Jesus is arrested, there is nothing more for him to do or say. In fact, his power, his control, that authority he has been given will be slowly taken away from him until he is left naked, dead, on the cross. There is nothing more that Jesus can do. Now events just need to play themselves out and folk need to place their trust in him. And so he prays for himself that what he has said and what he has done and what he has instigated would be the will of his father and be effective. That it would be the work that he had been given to do. This is one of those moments when it's hard to envisage what Jesus was facing and going through. And it's harder to see what God is saying to us about prayer. Not many of us will face arrest and crucifixion in the next 24 hours. However, many of us will know what it is like to be given work to do by God, called to a task or a ministry, a role within the church or community, and Perhaps more of us still can resonate with that sense in which sometimes we, we get to the point when we have done everything we possibly can. And if the fruitful, right, God-shaped thing is to happen, well, that's going to need God to come and take what you have done and add something by his grace and his blessing to it to make, make it happen. You see, to do that, and what, what I see here in Jesus' prayer, well, I find that... I find that deeply personal, open and honest sharing. There's a deep sharing here, isn't there, about himself. When we pray like this, not, not being the perfect son of God like Jesus, well, we'll need to be sharing honestly about, about who we are, how we feel, what, what has been achieved, where we have fallen short of what God has called us to do. And to be the people he wants us to be. And in prayer God is able to minister, to heal, to work, to add grace and blessing, to bring his will to bear in our lives. Sometimes it feels a lot easier to pray this stuff for others. Because surely you and God both know exactly what they're like. But even Jesus starts with himself. 
and the work that he had been given to do and the person he was called to be and how he was getting on. So shouldn't we? This prayer is for now. It's a prayer for God's glory. It's a prayer for Jesus himself and the work that he had been called to do. And finally, it's a prayer for holiness. So Jesus finishes this section of his prayer with verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. There's a sense here in which Jesus is praying not just for the completion of a piece of work or a chapter of time, but that all things would be complete, that he would indeed take his rightful place in heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father in heaven. We know that as Christ offered himself up on the cross to death, so in the resurrection is a heavenly Father raising him to, to new resurrection life and has exalted him to the highest place and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But this completion of things, this sharing in God's glory, required Jesus to first hand himself over to God, to take him and work in him and through him, to offer himself humbly before his heavenly father, becoming like a servant, it said in Philippians at the start of our service. That in God's hands and by God's grace and work in him, he might work his holy, powerful and transforming work. As we pray, so we need to move on from praying about now to to offer, offer ourselves humbly before God, handing ourselves over to him, asking that he take his rightful place in our hearts and our lives as, as Lord of all, asking that he would take us and use us and transform us and mold us and shape us. We hold loosely to the future and all our plans so that in offering ourselves and our time and our energy, even these days, God's will might be done in us that by his grace we will be transformed from one degree of glory to another till in heaven we take our place casting our crowns before him lost in wonder, love and praise. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. In our wanderings be our guide 
And so, friends, we gather around the table, and as we do so, let's, let's pray. Lord God, in the quiet and in this moment now, we take the opportunity to pray for ourselves. As we become aware of of our own hearts and our minds and our souls right now, we pray for how we find ourselves in this hour, in this moment. We bring you specific requests, Lord God, for the things we need in our lives. knowing that by your love and your grace, you hear our prayer. And Lord God, we pray we pray for ourselves and that, that sense of who you've called us to be and the work that you have given us to do. And Lord God, we, we open ourselves to you, acknowledging that we have made mistakes along the way. We have turned from you. We are sinful people in need of your grace and your mercy. And so, Lord God, we come before you seeking forgiveness. Forgiveness that we know is available through Jesus Christ because he has lived and he has died. Died for our sin. Died the death we deserve. But is risen to new life showing that he has conquered sin and death, that there is now nothing that can separate us from your love, and that by your Holy Spirit you can transform us and renew us into the people you would have us be. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would restore us in your image, that when we find that there is nothing more that we can do to be the people you would have us be, Lord God, we rejoice that your spirit heals, your spirit sanctifies and makes holy, your spirit brings wisdom and truth and grace. And so Lord God, as we, as we recognize your spirit's presence amongst us now, we pray Holy Spirit that you would transform the bread and wine, the, the, the bit of food and bit of drink that is beside us now into symbols of Christ's body broken and his blood poured out. And that by eating and drinking, so we renew our faith and our trust in him, looking to feast on him and his goodness and grace in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, transform us from one degree of glory into another. And Lord God, as we, as we pray that you would move in our lives, so we ask that we might glorify our Heavenly Father. that we might be and able to take our place as part of the team rather than just a supporter interested to see what happens. Lord God, show us how we might glorify you, how we might honor you, how we might serve you, 
how we might be about your will. Oh, and Lord God, we look forward to that day when moment by moment, day by day, we journey closer to that day when we join with all of the saints around your heavenly throne. We worship you, bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When every name will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee bow. And so, Lord God, receive our thanks and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as I lead us through this next part of our liturgy of the service, um, do just copy me if you have some bread to hand. Now is the time to, to have it close by and in a moment we'll break that and eat and I'll leave a little pause for each of you who might be watching this to, to do that. And so we remember that as the Apostle Paul wrote that he received from the Lord what he also passed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for responding in grace and love to us reaching out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and moving by your Holy Spirit amongst us. As we felt your loving presence, so we want to pray now not just for ourselves, but for others. We pray for those who we know that need to know your loving touch and your grace and your healing hands and strengthening hands in their lives. Lord God, we pray for members of our church family who are struggling at this time, those who are ill, those who feel isolated and lonely, those who are mourning for loved ones. We lift them to you and others now by 
by name in our hearts. Lord God, we pray for your peace and your comfort. And we pray that you might show us how we can glorify you by reaching out to the folk that we have just been praying for. How we might serve you by loving them. And Lord God, we want to thank you and praise you that you hear our prayer. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your truth. And we ask that the Lord Jesus Christ would receive all glory, honour and praise due to his name, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so, friends, we sing together our final hymn this evening, Love Divine, or Love's Excelling.
Amen. Well, thank you, friends, for joining us as we've worshipped. I hope and pray that God has, has moved by his spirit within you and you have heard his voice and felt his presence as we have uh, as we've worshipped Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. So uh, really good that you've been able to join with us. I'm going to close now with the words of the blessing. And so may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all, this day and always. Amen.